<laughs> Welcome, Patreons, to Fight Night. You can tell by the new intro music, this is something new. So we have referenced throughout this year many of the catty spats between our favorite philosophers. Some of them are petty, some of them are personal, and some of them are actually theoretical, although that's probably in the minority. But I'm thinking of Derrida versus Foucault, Deleuze versus Foucault, Badiou versus Deleuze, Zizek versus, versus Deleuze. Foucault. Damn, Deleuze seems to get into these a lot despite uh, his reputation being as non-confrontational and rather generous, but... Uh, I don't know. A lot of people write books about why he's wrong. But then we got Guattari versus Lacan, Adorno versus Marcuse, Marcuse, Baudrillard versus everybody. There's Zizek versus Laclau versus Judith Butler, probably versus the early Zizek soon enough. Spivak wrote against uh, Derrida, his understanding of Marx. Anyway, there's an endless series that could be done here, and we're kicking it off today. Because it's also, I think, a good way of getting clear about what they're being spiteful about and where the actual confrontation lies. Um, and it's a good way to learn some of the differences uh, about their thinking. Any thoughts on that? Okay. So we're going to do a series. <laughs> we're going to do a series. It might be interrupted by other stuff, but we thought we'd do something a little longer form, each dealing with one theorist criticizing another theorist. And if we don't get bored with it, we could go all the way back to Schelling versus Hegel. But today, <laughs> as the title said, we're looking at Baudrillard versus Foucault. That one I actually find a bit sad since they were like legit friends, not just like intellectual colleagues, as it were. You know, they were roommates for a little while and then they broke apart. But I, I had a quick question, actually, and a anyone can jump in here. Mike, like, close to your face. Look how far it is. Yeah. But one of the weird <laughs> things about academics is that academics are really very petty, spiteful, precious people for the most part. Like I can't think of many academics who've handled being criticized in a serious way by someone else well. Uh, usually the kind of visceral reaction is a combination of, oh, you're not even good enough for me to respond to. to and blocking you on Facebook? Yeah, and, then, well, and that, or, or how dare you, you know, <laughs> criticize my genius, right? So I'm, I want to know, can anybody think of somebody who's handled legitimate criticism well? I'm not talking about like the petty insults, bad faith argumentation, but like somebody wrote a critique of their work and they responded with, maybe not, you know, I agree, but at least like this was interesting or I kind of can see where they're coming from. I, I take everything you just said as a personal attack on me and I it was intended as such. <laughs> I refuse to respond. It is beneath me. Fuck you. One person criticized Derrida. It might have been Searle. And then Derrida responded by cutting up the entire, the person's entire essay. Was it Searle? He yeah. cut up his entire essay and responded to him with only quotations from him woven together into an article. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it was uh, the New York Review of Books. So I wrote um, a review of basically Derrida's whole oeuvre and called him not quite a pseudo-philosopher, but close to a pseudo-philosopher. And this was shortly after the whole Cambridge controversy, uh, where a bunch of big analytic philosophers tried to keep Derrida from receiving an honorary degree from the institution. So to be fair, he was probably feeling a little bit attacked by th that stream of thought by that I point. Mean you're already kind of setting yourself up for a little bit of a distorted perspective of these things by taking these sorts of very well publicized and like event like like encounters between big famous academics as anything like a indication of how they get along or how their ideas are actually gotcha. formed. Like a lot of these communities of French writers, like whatever you got, you got Baudrillard, Derrida, Barthes, Foucault, Deleuze and Guattari. It's more like a, it's like a community of philosophers that are developing all these ideas between each other. Like these moments are like exclamation points that like punctuate the development of French theory. But I, don't, I think they're very superficial in terms of oh, yeah. like indicative of these people's like intellectual developments or, I mean, of course, you hear about things like they fall, they have fallings out, they stop talking to each other, they quit the French Communist Party, which is a pretty radical gesture for a French intellectual. But I mean, I don't, I, I don't think it has a whole lot of bearing. Did you know? I only learned this from reading the introduction to the book today, which is "Forget Foucault." 
antagonistically titled. Yeah. But Baudrillard and Guattari were in the same Maoist group pre-68. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. No. Yeah, there's always these interesting connections between them. Yeah, the, the introduction brings up a couple. Wow. They work I, together here and there. I was going to say, there's only three examples of like an academic spat I know of where people handled it with grace, and maybe people can come up with another one. Uh, there was Malthus and Ricardo in the 19th century, since apparently, despite the fact that they criticized each other religiously, um, they were actually best friends. Uh, they were able to put that aside when they hung out with one another. Then there was Habermas, um, actually with Derrida, and then later on with Rawls. Apparently, Derrida and Habermas got along pretty well near the end, despite like attacking each other for years. And then I guess the last one uh, would probably be uh, Rawls and Nozick. So Nozick was a big libertarian thinker in analytic circles. But you know, he brought a lot of criticisms of Rawls. Rawls apparently liked the work, went back and forth, and they were okay with it. But can people think of anything else? Well, Derrida's known, and Deleuze, I guess, are they're known for being not too egoist. Yeah, I've heard Derrida. Uh, compa- <laughs> compared to Foucault, who will read being criticized today. I heard I heard that about Derrida, too. Like, I, I heard that he was, like, when people were being generous or engaging with his work, he tend to be pretty generous back with, with people. Like I know he would like, he, he would hang out with, with I think a few different interpreters of him who disagreed with each other, but he would like still like, so I'm thinking about the, the Christian one, uh, who's, who's at Villanova. What's his name? Um, Uh, Caputo. uh, Caputo. Yeah. Caputo. And then, and then she, and then I think he would also hang out with the other guy, like Michael, like Nas or Nas or something like that. And they both like hated each other, I think, but Derrida would like correspond with both of them anyway. Yeah. Just because they're theorists doesn't mean they are above petty rivalries. I think mm-hmm. that they enjoy petty rivalries precisely because they're theorists. It might be incorrect that they actually hated each other, but I just know that both of those interpreters disagreed about what they thought Derrida thought, I think. And then, but like, I think he would still give them both time, the time of day. Well, it's funny. I posted a meme today about Hegel. Uh, it's a guy trying to pick up a girl by quoting Hegel. And somebody said, like, isn't that a little really unrealistic? Would people actually talk about Hegel during a date? And I was like, one, I've done it with my wife. So it's, it is definitely possible. But number two, I'm like, I don't think you understand how seriously people will take the interpretation of Hegel. Like, I was at a conference once where after a couple beers, how to interpret the phenomenology of spirit almost led two people to come to blows with one another. Like, they were fucking yelling and screaming and livid about how to read this book. So I'm like, people can actually get really fucking engaged by this shit. Yeah, for sure. And I guess we're bringing this all up, obviously, because uh, I don't like I think as a result of this book, right, Forget Foucault, there was like quite a rift. I mean, I don't know the full background of the story, but I think uh, like Baudrillard was kind of shunned by the French intellectual circles. Is that right? Well, you can't come at Foucault in the 70s. He's at Collège de France, the premier school. He's king shit, still friends with Deleuze at this point, and he's enjoying also celebrity. So Baudrillard, younger, the iconoclast extraordinaire, he's relatively unknown or not nearly as popular anyway. But he comes at the king with an article entitled, as I said, Forget Foucault. Um, and the easiest way to draw ire from Baudrillard in the first place is to be a celebrity all, at all. That's true. Let alone one that talks about power. So, <laughs> Which is ironic. So Pills, I'm hoping. Letter cited in the Matrix and stuff, right? So Pills, I'm hoping you can kind of explain the argument to me from this because I mean I got I think I got the basic outline from reading the introduction and the and the and the text, but you know I did I did I was reminded because I guess I haven't been reading French philosophy lately. I was very much viscerally reminded of the obtuseness of sometimes the the, the way there's <laughs> a lot of um, you know there's the typical thing where there's like meanderings and like pr- like kind of like mentioning different views of different things and like you can't really tell if it's his view or if he's like presenting someone else's view and he's clearly talking about ideas of other philosophers without naming them a few times like i think Delu- a lot of deleuzean concepts come up i think if i'm not mistaken which i don't read deleuze never read deleuze so like that stuff was it was unclear whether he was presenting foucault's views deleuze's views or his views i don't know help me out here I was shocked how clear this was. Yeah, <laughs> for, <laughs> very accessible for Baudrillard, well, at least compared to for his uh, his later work. But he's much more direct about what his arguments are than uh, something like the Gulf War never took place. I sure. also wanted to say that this is most French essay I've ever fucking read, like far and away since 
it literally included a phrase like the political economy of the phallus. And I'm like, only a French philosopher could combine revolution and sex together into a phrase like that, like the twin obsessions. No. Oh, yeah, about a third of it is about pornography, so. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> it also opens saying Foucault's writing is perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That was which, interesting. Which is a very interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Only he could use perfect as an insult. Well, there it is. Well, there it is. well that's what I was just going to say. Without, I didn't. I, I read the introduction after reading the main text, and I noticed, and it, and to me, without knowing, obviously, it did immediately come across as sarcastic to me at the beginning. I don't know if that was correct or not. No, I think he means it's literally too perfect which yeah. is why yeah, too perfect which is why it doesn't because it seduces you with I mean, its like perfection it, it's a perfect it's a perfect uh reflection of the phenomenon that he's trying to explain which for baudrillard is a sign that what he's actually trying to explain is probably something like dead and irrelevant now well you can definitely tell that when reading foucault's books right like uh my understanding of him as a kind of theorist, or like his method, his approach, right, was that he was a bit of a perfectionist, right? He would apparently spend hours and hours um, in various libraries researching his topics and, and write and rewrite his texts. And you can really see that, right? Uh, you know, Victor was making fun of French philosophy earlier, and I 100% sympathize with. But you read Foucault's books, and there's actually a lot of literary virtues to them, right? Well, Foucault's way clearer than this. Yeah. Foucault's writing is generally pretty clear, I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, when it comes to, like, when, when you on balance, uh, like, thinking about French philosophy, generally, it's pretty easy, I think. Yeah, and it has, like, vivid phrases, right? Like, everybody remembers the intro to uh, Discipline and Punish. Everybody remembers, you know, the History of Sexuality, Volume 1, where he's like, we must cut off the head of the king. Uh, people really remember, you know, the Panopticon and stuff about knowledge power. Like he was very precise and pretty uh, in the way that yeah. he constructed his books right? and his articles. I, I, I find it all pretty difficult. Yeah. So Pills, like help, help me out here. Like, uh, you know, what's what's what do you what do you take to be the main argument? And then and then I'm going to see if what you say is what I took away from it or not. <laughs> well, I thought I we haven't really talked on this podcast about May 68 yet. So I was seeing okay. this in the context of May 68. So should I just explain the thesis or talk about May 68 first? I think that's a good idea. Uh, whatever, whatever, yeah, maybe whatever you think makes the most sense. Okay. So after May 68, there was a big general strike in mainly Paris. And it was looking like there could be a communist overthrow of the de Gaulle government. Um, and it was crucial for the French left because all the guys that we talk about, they were young, a lot younger than we know them from the heights of their careers. But they're all in like various communist parties. Some were Maoist, some were Marxist-Leninist. And there was a, a quite powerful French communist party. It wasn't winning elections, but it was like it was relevant. Um, so there's a general general strike largely of students and the trade unions. And we don't need to go into too much detail here, but the radicals wanted to uh, overthrow the government or call an election. And the po the communist party, this or the way that the French left, academic left felt was that the communist party betrayed the students because it settled for uh, wage increases for, for workers rather than like revolution. So they, the radicals felt betrayed because they had all this energy. People were in the streets, barricading buildings and all that. And the Communist Party sold them out. So to them, this was symbolically the left dying in, in France or the radical left dying in France. So then the response in theory to this, uh, you can kind of tell, is people don't really know whether they're Marxists anymore, unless you're like Sartre. Mm -hmm. But everyone else is trying to figure out, okay, what do we do to be Marxists now that the Marxist party in France is a, a lib party, basically. <laughs> um, and obviously Foucault has one sort of answer to that. Deleuze and Guattari and Antiedipus have one sort of answer to that. Uh, Baudrillard attacks both of them. So this is against both Deleuze and Guattari and Foucault, mainly Foucault because his previous book was more against Deleuze and Guattari. But you have to read this entire paper through desire. What is desire? Yeah. Is it the is it the psychoanaly psychoanalysis desire of lack, or is it the Deleuze desire of production? And this is mm -hmm. what his main criticism of Foucault is here: is Foucault doesn't have any desire. He has no location for desire in the subject because all there is is power. And this is why he he criticizes this text for being too or 
it's basically uh, Foucault's history of sexuality is the main reference. But he says it's too perfect because Foucault has this wide ranging analysis. Baudrillard calls it a spiral that starts mm -hmm. at the widest possible social layer, like uh, actual institutions, institutions, uh, the church, psychiatric institutions that define or they have they proliferate power. And this goes all the way down to the individual where you internalize power. And that's just what happens from top to bottom in, in a, a system of power. And that's what's yep. too perfect, right? There's no cracks. Reality is complete. It's power from the macrocosmic to the microcosmic. You can't make any actions in the world because it's all just power anyway. So if power is everything, then it's not really anything. And Baudrillard's quite incisive uh, remark here is that he's just describing capital except he's mirroring capital. And describing capital is uh, no longer revolutionary activity. It's just mirroring the status quo. And he says actually the same thing about Deleuze, that Deleuze wants to turn everything into flows, movement, productivity. Well, mm. that's the same thing that capitalism does. So Baudrillard's out-radicalizing them, I think, is his, is his goal, and saying you're just copying the world around you um, and admitting defeat, basically. Yeah, I think in in setting the context, the the um, the the introductory essay says that the in, in reference to the sixty eight rebellion, it says the the introducer says here uh, the student rebellion has proved at least one thing: the French Communist Party, trade unions, and the working class, the entire institutional left, had ceased to be revolutionary. The communist bureaucracy had not thrown its might on the side of the student revolt. Instead, it pressed the besieged government for salary incre increases. Then it goes on to say, no wonder French post-68 thinkers like Baudrillard looked elsewhere for revolutionary alternatives, failing to enlist their allies. They resolved to sleep with the enemy. And I think a little bit of this uh, perfection that he's talking about, the way it just sort of mirrors the functioning of power in actual societies, that's this idea of sleeping with the enemy. It's almost like a new move. Instead of starting a movement where we take it down, we almost like penetrate inside and try to sort of mimic the flow of like, I guess this is more Baudrillard's argument, but what they're doing is mimicking, mimicking the flow of power and the flow of desire as a kind of flow of capital. Yeah, I want to say, I thought this was a, a really well done essay, actually. Uh, I have issues with it and I don't think it's true to Foucault's thought, uh, but it does land some hits and we can get into why later on. But what I want to say is uh, I usually, for my own interpretation of Foucault, draw on Thomas Lemke's book, um, the theory of governmentality um, in Michel Foucault's writing, uh, where he tends to periodize Foucault and says, look, Foucault had this early archaeological period where he's talking about how knowledge forms itself into discourses and language. Uh, then later on, he has a genealogical period that becomes more overtly Nietzschean, uh, where he talks about how it is that discourse instantiates itself in very material kinds of power, you know, disciplinary power, biopolitics, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a final phase into his work, uh, which is an ethical turn uh, and formulations on the subject, right? Uh, how it is that power now creates certain kind of subjects uh, who might be able to inter internalize various forms of subjugation, uh, or they might be able to be transformed into subjects who have the right ethos uh, to engage in projects of self-creation, right? And I think Lemke's um, periodization is really helpful. Um, but one of the things that comes across it is that, from reading Foucault this way, is that Baudrillard is kind of right. Foucault almost had a perfect career, right? Everything fits together. You can see the clear developments in his work. Uh, and he really comes across looking a little bit like a hedge, or sorry, a, a hedgehog uh, in the classy and Berlinian typology, right? Somebody who's able to fit every aspect of reality into this ever-encompassing system. Uh, and I think it's not a coincidence that he was uh, good friends for a little while with Deleuze, uh, who of the major post-structuralist thinkers is the only other one I can think of who really comes close to building something like a classical philosophical system, right? Uh, but Koch often comes close as well. Uh, and Baudrillard in this essay comes across very differently, right? He's much more of a foxy character. Uh, it's much harder to pin down his work in any way. Uh, he wrote many, many different books, uh, plenty of which are quite imperfect, but you can always kind of see his ideas on the run and developing. Uh, and he seems to almost be reacting viscerally against 
the systematic aspirations uh, and the architectonic way mode of thought uh, that he still at the text as being present in Foucault's thinking. Uh, so I think it might not even not necessarily just be a philosophical issue, uh, but even an aesthetic and a personal one, right? He just doesn't like this way of looking at things. And interestingly, uh, Foucault said when, because Baudrillard kind of ran this by him before he published it, and Foucault said he would respond. He didn't, apparently got pissy about it and didn't respond to it. The other criticism that he never responded to is Derrida's, and Derrida just said that Foucault's reinstantiating metaphysics with this power thing. Because what is if it's everything, then it's not anything, and you can't deconstruct it. So those were the two critiques. I think, Victor, you said these are the two critiques that he never responded to, and they are saying much the same thing. Um, I wanted to give one quote that I think sums it up. He says, uh, this is actually, you can tell in here, it's a critique of both Deleuze and Foucault at the same time. So Baudrillard- I actually had a quick question before you give the quote. I was just wondering, Pills, because I, as a non-Deleuzean, like, I was wondering when I was reading this, is it a coincidence that uh, both Deleuze and Foucault call themselves Nietzscheans, uh, that like that like Baudrillard's critique is both at targeting them, or is that just kind of incidental? Uh, well, I think Baudrillard is very Nietzschean also, oh, okay. also okay. I would say. But yeah, I guess the... I guess it depends on what part of Nietzsche you're talking about, because you can also talk about a Nietzschean metaphysics, too, or right, a his, right. or the historiography of Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. And Baudrillard is much more like we need to have to dis, disenchant our theory, I would think. So that's one Nietzschean impulse, as opposed to let's uh, let's trace the history of morality, which is kind of Foucault's approach. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the uh, the uh, one who wrote the introduction to this, uh, Silver Lotringer, suggests that Baudrillard was uh, trying to out Nietzsche Foucault in oh. some ways here. Let me give this one quote because it it it's, yeah. it shows his attack on both uh, Deleuze and Foucault at the same time. This compulsion. Oh, this is Baudrillard, by the way. This compulsion towards liquidity, flow, and an accelerated circulation of what is psychic sexual or pertaining to the body is the exact replica of the force which rules market value capital must circulate gravity and any fixed point must disappear the chain of investments and reinvestments must never stop value must radiate endlessly and in every direction so in saying that uh i Deleu or baudrillard is saying both deleuze's desire deleuze and Guattari's desire excuse me and Foucault's power is this kind of endless, um, unbounded reproduction of itself. And that means that there's no way inside or no way outside of it. So they're really just writing about the thing that they should be uh, trying to do violence against. So Baudrillard, as an iconoclast, he thinks the goal of theory is violence against the status quo. Whereas he's saying that uh, these two are just reproducing the status quo. That's interesting. Yeah, and the, and the reason there's no desire in Foucault is because power plays that role. That's kind of what he says. He says they're the same thing. You can you can interchange them, and the and the there's a nice metaphor in the introduction that that the exchange value between the two is is almost nothing. Yeah, Deleuze didn't like that at all. He didn't like hearing that. Yeah, like you can just take one out for the other, and there's nothing gained or lost, which is a kind of interesting way to look at theories if, if all these theories sort of become these detached floating signifiers that only just reference each other and there's no you know exchange value between them as, as we would think of exchange value as being between the Canadian dollar and the American dollar and the Australian and whatever if there's no if there's no exchange value then there's no kind of motivation to move between currencies because they're all just kind of the same thing <laughs> It's kind of, it's a pretty it's a pretty bad uh diss I'd say. Well that's funny because like that is some that is like um I thought that was one of the more interesting parts of the essay just because that's something that I think uh anyone who reads a lot of different theory like will come across thinking like okay like in this theory like what role is this concept playing that is being played you know like I even just think of a Merleau-Pontian the like the habit body and it's like you know how is that it's like a different level of description for what like Foucault might be talking about with the way that power is like, is like, um, is, uh, whatever 
put onto bodies, uh, you know, and it's like, there's just different levels of describing the same thing. And I think that's like a worthwhile philosophical exercise in general to like figure out what the exchange value is. And in that sense, like, you know, what new is actually being provided by this different way of framing the phenomenon of, of like, uh, social interactions in the world, like what's actually being added, if anything at all, or is it just a different word to describe something that's already being described uh, in another theory. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. I'm not sure where I stand because as I said, I haven't really read Deleuze, so I don't know how how much of a role or how similar the role is that desire is playing in in uh, in Deleuze as, as power is in Foucault. This is what I wanted to say, like just in response actually to what uh, Eric was saying and drawing upon uh, Baudrillard's own work on, um, you know, signs um, and the kind of way that signs speak to each other, starting with uh, simulacra and simulacrum, right? Because uh, Pills mentioned at the beginning that all these different thinkers are going to respond to May 68 uh, in a fundamental way. Uh, and it's worth noting that this is around the, the time uh, when all of them released their first major works. So Baudrillard released, um, you know, uh, Towards the Political Economy of the Sign, you know, the System of Objects in 1968. Uh, Foucault released History of Madness. Uh, Derrida released uh, Of Grammatology. I think it was in 68, wasn't it? Or 66? Yeah. Around that time. 68. Um, so, you know, they all burst onto the scene and they all start to adopt this very punk attitude uh, towards the events of May 1968, whereas Pell says they become increasingly iconoclastic, right? Uh, you know, you have Foucault with his leather jacket talking constantly about power, uh, Deleuze referencing things like the American beat poets uh, and the potential they have to give you a kind of a vision of an emancipated life. But I don't think anybody went as far uh, in an almost nihilistic direction uh, as somebody like Baudrillard. And I mean that in a positive sense. You know, I'm not being pejorative here uh, because the sense that I got from reading this essay is that Foucault, for all he becomes a kind of punk criticizing conventional materialism, uh, is still attracted to this idea that we need to analyze society in terms of power dynamics and commit ourselves to an emancipatory politics um, of self-creation. There's still this kind of ethical project underpinning it uh, and a kind of residual belief that history can be changed uh, by restructuring society. Um, but of course, you know, you see somebody like Baudrillard, he was always unafraid of saying things like, look, there's all these French philosophers talking about why we need to protest the Gulf War. The Gulf War never happened, right? It occurred on TV. Uh, he had this famous expression when he was asked to kind of give a report on the war. He said, well, I don't want to go to uh, Saudi Arabia to report on the Gulf War. I want to watch it on CNN because that's where the war is actually going to be waged, you know, in the television sets of the American people, right? Uh, and it's very easy to see why he would kind of take this hyper iconoclastic, almost cheerfully nihilistic standpoint if you read his work, right? Uh, the kind of struggles for emancipation that earlier materialists, including himself uh, and system objects, uh, wanted to commit themselves to is predicated on the belief that we can't actually change real social relations. But we've now gone away from that. We've entered into a hyper real realm uh, where we're never going to be able to get connection to reality again and be able to change it. Uh, all that we're left now with is the opportunity to manipulate different kinds of signs in different ways, right? Uh, some of them might be more creative, some of them might be less creative, but that's what we're left with in our kind of postmodern era, right? Well, it's a very also, cynical idea, but it's kind of, it's very tantalizing, right? You're forgetting about the whole idea of symbolic exchange, because one thing that capitalist societies do not know how to do is symbolize death. They only symbolize it as a nothing. And he said, we can, if we can resuscitate death, it can't be exchanged for anything. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a really interesting thing. Cause he, he takes his, he takes some cues from uh, the anthropologist Marcel Mauss, right? Uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Who, who did a, uh, I guess he did some some ethnography of uh, of uh, was it northwestern American Aboriginal peoples and and the thing he called the potlash, mm. which was which which was the I, I'm going to terribly explain it but it, it's this sort of this idea within their society and how symbolic exchange works of somebody being ready to exchange everything to die in a sense within as as part of the conditions of the exchange whereas that sort of thing is is uh unfamiliar to capitalist modes of exchange i don't know if anyone can step in and and do a way better job than i just did of talking about potlash well it's the yeah it's a gift it's a gift in which things are not equivalent whereas capitalism makes everything equivalent to itself Everything can be, you know, bought, but also in a theoretical sense, everything can be represented. And then you get these 
theorists that are supposedly anti-capitalism and you can just exchange all their concepts between each other too. So if we had a, a true understanding of death back, then we could actually do violence to the system. He writes about well, uh, terrorism or like the theoretical terrorism on his uh, book on the two towers. And he wants to be a, a theoretical terrorist because you can't exchange it for anything. Yeah, here well, I think it's actually worth justifying. Uh, sorry, I'll just be very quick. Juxtaposing his work against Adorno and Horkheimer. We all know how Adorno and Horkheimer despise Disney, right? Saw Disney as a very dangerous figure, the main proponent of the culture industry who was peddling tripe uh, that was convincing people not to emancipate themselves, but instead to kind of liquidate uh, their critical consciousness uh, in various forms of one-dimensional entertainment. Uh, Baudrillard apparently went to Disney World uh, and said that Euro Disney World, excuse me, and he said that he loved it, right? He's like, why would I want to go to Europe if I could go to Euro Disneyland? You know, the food is better. I can go to Belgium, France, Italy, all in the course of five minutes. Uh, it's cheaper than having to travel around. Uh, and again, you know, this might seem like a kind of trite observation, and it's definitely quirky and funny, but I think it really goes to show you how deeply skeptical he was of this idea that anything like orthodox critical theory could now get us out of the trap that we're in. Uh, there's no point in being cynical about Disneyland any longer the way that Adorno and Harkheimer was, because we are faced with the Disneyfication, not just of our culture any longer, but the Disneyfication of all relations uh, within our life, according to the logic of exchange value. Well, you, you can see his post-human bent in this. Uh, we, we don't know how to die anymore. We don't know how to die because our entire cities are cities of death. They're all necropolises, he says. What is an acropolis exactly? Just the the cemetery district where you do burials and rituals related to death. Oh, those big mausoleums. Temples. Pills, earlier you were saying about that, like, you know, Foucault and Deleuze are supposedly kind of like reproducing a description that is like consistent, I guess, with the flows of capital. And I'm wondering, is this critique like... Because I guess, you know, as being someone who who is like early inspired to do continental philosophy from phenomenology and existentialism and, um, you know, I, I guess there's a there's a tension maybe in like what is philosophy supposed to be doing? Is it supposed to be a descriptive endeavor or is it supposed to be like somehow a normative, like inherently a normative endeavor? And maybe I'm maybe I'm I'm mis misunderstanding this, but, you know, is it is it Baudrillard's view? It sounds from what you're saying that Baudrillard's view is that. Um, philosophy must be trying to undermine the existing structures therefore just like to, so even if Foucault is describing that power is flowing in this way that is an accurate description to some extent of the way the world is it's like is Foucault is is Baudrillard's claim that by describing it you're somehow reinforcing it and and if that's the case that seems strange to me but capitalism and schizophrenia I mean it's in the title right of, of course it's about capitalism um but I think back to the 68 thing, his, what he's upset about is that they all, they're all pretending like they're radicals. They pretend like oh, okay. they're writing against the system. We're going to bring it down. And that's their intention. And this is like uh, Foucault's personality. He's like, oh, he's the, he's the ultimate punk, kind of like Matt said. But he's not, if that's the case. Then he's just what Baudrillard called, he says in this, he's the mirror, the mirror of capitalism is just uh Foucault's theory and because it's so perfect that's pretending like capitalism is perfect like it doesn't have cracks in it like it can't be resisted like it can't exchange everything for everything so if that's your right. if that's your attitude then I think he would think that's counter-revolutionary and not what theory is supposed to be doing right okay so it is supposed to be somehow revolutionary and I mean it's interesting because I do remember when I was reading Foucault you know that that there is a lot like I remember a lot of students in the seminar that I was in, you know, there is kind of an under like the tone that Foucault uses right when he's describing power. It's very ominous and it's got it's like very um, scary. It's yeah. got a normative bent to it. But ultimately, like it really is a description. Baudrillard and, says that. Yeah, he describes it as truth. Uh, and, you know, when you read the description, at least in you know discipline and punish and some of and some of his other stuff around the same time. Right. It really does kind of sound like there's no way of getting out of it. Right. Even though he's talking about these these the power and, and these dynamics in a way that makes it sound like it's bad. But he's and I guess, you know, at the time I was like, well, he's just offering a description. And, you know, from my sort of 
outlook of being, uh, you know, kind of from coming from a phenomenologist at the time perspective, I was like, oh, well, that's fine. Doing a description of, of power structures, there's nothing. And then it's someone else's job, you know, to come along with the description and be like, well, here's how we can undermine uh, these power structures. It, like, um, so, yeah, that's. But uh, even aside from the revolutionary aspect of it, we have to remind our listeners and maybe even ourselves that this is after each of them had published like two or three books. This is halfway through. He's not talking about Deleuze's philosophical project that comes later. He's not talking about Foucault's biopolitics that comes later. It's basically the history of sexuality era and the capitalism and schizophrenia uh, era. I mean, I in, in a sense, just to go back over a couple of things, I think, yeah, in a way, the, the sort of perfect reflection of the flows of power or the flows of desire, this perfect reflection idea is, yeah, he's, he's commenting on it being a descriptive enterprise and and to that extent like you know all description is normative there's no there's no two ways yeah, about sure. it all representation is normative because it says this is how you should see this this phenomenon is thus it is always normative so they're very they're very very attuned to that sort of idea and i wouldn't i i wouldn't i don't know if he's he's using sort of hegel's idea of philosophy here and reversing it in a way but you know like Maybe I'm paraphrasing this wrong, but in Hegel's view, philosophy is is meant to grasp the current historical moment, and as a result of that, it can only sort of come afterward, right? In in order to do this, but what what Baudrillard is saying here, and I'm just like peppering a quote in, he's saying the very perfection of this analytical chronicle of power is disturbing, and then skipping, he says, if it is possible at last to talk with such definitive understanding about power sexuality, the body, and discipline, even down to their most delicate metamorphoses. It is because at some point all this is here and now over with. And that goes back again to the idea that, you know, if if we can so perfectly grasp the workings of some system, whether it's a system of power or flows of capital or desire, if we can grasp these all the way down to their molecular minutia, I think in a sense it, it's irrelevant to the current moment now, like it's been done with. And mm -hmm. I think that links to the later idea of the Messiah is always going to come late. The Messiah always comes sort of a day after the revolution has been completed. You know, and, and really this is all to find another way of talking about revolution that isn't in itself kind of counter-revolutionary because you really only have two binaries here. You have the bourgeois or you have revolution or you have something that's just stuck in the middle and kind of just floundering within the system. Well, I'm going to put it a somewhat different way, because when I was reading his ruminations about Foucault's theory of power, which I thought were really smart, uh, a quote occurred to me. I think it was by Lacan, but it might be from Zizek, kind of paraphrasing Lacan, uh, where he says, if you're looking at a parade uh, with a king and his soldiers, uh, there are two mistakes that people can make. Uh, the first one is the peasant can actually assume that the king is a king in himself. Uh, but the second mistake is that the king can assume that he's a king in himself without all the peasants believing him to be such. Uh, and what I think Foucault, uh, Baudrillard is saying here is, look, this idea that you come across in Foucault is that power is something real. In fact, it's so real that it's omnipresent. It kind of filters through everything. And what we need to recognize is that power is actually a kind of abstraction, right? It only exists to the extent that we allow it to exist, right? Uh, emerging from our subjectivity and then filtering through our institutions and via political economy. And so the more radical gesture isn't to say something like Foucault does, uh, as Victor put it, this kind of dismal, gloomy uh, claim that power is omnipresent and everywhere, uh, is to say something like power doesn't exist anywhere unless we believe it to exist and allow it to exist um, in our kind of hyper real universe right now. Uh, and so he's almost standing aside, uh, outside of society and mocking it for the pretense of believing that we are actually living in this huge disciplinary evil system uh, and that this is inexorable and there's nothing we can do about it when this is really just the product uh, of discourses and human imaginations, right? Yeah, and I will say too, you know, that uh, that when I, I, re I remember also a big argument in seminar when I was reading Foucault was like, it doesn't seem like there's any way out of this. And I would be curious to hear from the people here who are more familiar with Deleuze, Pills, or maybe Eric, um, 
you know, like, it, do, do you get a similar sense from Deleuze, right? That, that it's like, there's no way out of this process or like, is it, or is it even like, do you find it? Like, I would like to know if, if, it, if that's like a, can, if there really is a parallel between the way Deleuze sets things up and the way Foucault sets things up and in the sense that there's, it's a mirror and it's not clear how you could get out of it. It's kind of like all encompassing. You just need to smoke more cigarettes in order to comprehend this, Victor. That's the key to every French philosopher. Yeah, you know? more French sure. cigarettes. More I don't French know. I mean, more. I I tried to kill that. I tried to kill that like reaction in me. I always sent that natural like idea of like, like okay, how do we get out of it, or like wh- how do, what's the cash out here? I try to like kill that in me because I find it just gets in the way of reading the actual text and trying to understand the thinker from like top to bottom instead of jumping to, okay, what are like the cliff notes here? Because like, sure. yeah, I mean, with people as, as sort of, I don't want to say totalizing, but yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of room for human agency in Foucault or Baudrillard. And so that leads you to the conclusion that will then like, what or can Deleuze? be done? Uh, Deleuze is really all, I mean, Deleuze, I wouldn't say that about Deleuze because agency and desire play a huge role, at least the language of it does, but more so in Foucault and Baudrillard. You know, Foucault has the genealogical method, and I think what Baudrillard is introducing here is more of uh, talking about simulation as a sort of baseline methodological reference for his work now, and saying that, you know, the genealogical method has only gotten us so far. But what they do build around those methods is like this very totalizing system that seems to have no agency in it. And that was a big debate, you know, like structure of agency, Adam Giddens and things like that, and like texts like that were thinking about where can agency come into play. And that seems to say, well, there's nothing that can be done. But I think there are ways that these things play out that you do have to sort of pay attention to instead of instead of getting discouraged by the fact that yeah even like the adorno horkheimer vision of the culture industry right like there's nothing you can do i think instead of getting discouraged by that too early you have to kind of put yourself in a mode where you're going to you're going to persevere and try to get everything out of this text before then asking the okay what now questions sure sure well, here, I, I, mean, here, I agree I with it. you but, but I, I can I, answer that question okay. so he's responding to again capitalism and schizophrenia and the goal of that book, or those books, um, anti Oedipus, is let's free desire because desires are being managed, controlled by the psychoanalysts, by the education system, whatever, by capitalism. And like he says, or like Deleuze and Guattari say, yeah, desire does mimic the form of capitalism, but you can also direct desire because it's productive. Um, and then later on, Later, Deleuze says, we can actually create or produce, in, De- in Baudrillard's terms, we can produce our way out of this by inventing concepts, by, by mapping things together, by echoing the history of philosopher- philosophy, if you're a philosopher. That's kind of your task. Now, if we can set up an imaginary debate about how Baudrillard would res- respond to that if he's taking this line, I think Baudrillard would ask Deleuze again. He says, okay, you're creating concepts and you want these concepts to echo through the history of philosophy and, and, and create new ways of thinking. Now, how do you know that you're just not creating a new sign? Yeah. So that would be the question. And I don't, I'm not smart enough to have an answer to that. Maybe some grad student out there has written a paper on it, but I don't have an answer I th- to that. I think this is another, this is definitely another way Baudrillard would question what you were saying is he would he would look at the way that you know i get he would remind Deleuze and Guattari so you, your concept of desire is born out of a you're not happy with Lacan's idea of desire as lack as something negative so what you've done is you've turned it around and taken this sort of what what Baudrillard calls a negative reactive transcendental concept and you've turned it into something positive active and imminent in the system. So what he, what he says here is that the new version of desire proposed by Deleuze and by Leotard, because Leotard's also talking about intensities and tensors, uh, proposed by Deleuze and Leotard, but there, instead of a lack or interdiction, that means, you know, you're not allowed to do something, an interdiction, instead of a lack or an interdiction, one finds the deployment of the positive dissemination of flows and intensities. 
such a coincidence is not accidental. It's simply that in Foucault, power power takes the place of desire. So he he's he's attuned to that that idea of positivity, of production, of desiring machines as productive machines, uh, as it essentially being a positive rather than a negative concept. But he's still not happy with it because he thinks it's. I think near the end he come he starts coming to say again it's it's one sided because it only has that positive aspect it doesn't have the negative side where I guess that's another reversal here because he's all about reversals instead of irreversible processes it doesn't have that negative side where power comes back and acts upon itself in a certain way it it becomes sort of crystallized and frozen in the moment of your analysis rather than being allowed to continue to sort of collapse in on itself. He says that Deleuze and Guattari's desire is, quote, just a savage naturalism, unquote, which is basically saying you're just putting a new name onto human labor power and then calling it productive desire. So he, yeah, he's basically that, reinstating, and here's Baudrillard's big problem. He's basically just reinstating human nature, but giving it a different name. Now, I don't think that's mm. correct all the way down because that desiring production is not at all a human function, really. I don't think it's, I don't think it's nearly as naturalist as Baudrillard is claiming. And I would criticize him on that point. But again, I don't know. I mean, this is a, a lot of it comes from later Deleuze, which I have the benefit of history, I can read back into the first book, which Baudrillard did not have. Yeah, na naturalization would be to say, I think they're following like um, the idea of mythology as a, as a force which naturalizes something. It makes it seem universal and ahistorical and apolitical. That's what sort of naturalizing something does. So you kind of take it out of any kind of possible historical dialectic and hold it up as like, ah, here is a fundamental principle on, on which to build other analyses, which in a very, very roundabout way sort of goes back to Descartes' idea of like, what's the first thing that we can be certain of? Like the I think. And then from there, you can build a whole, you can erect an entire foundation for, for knowledge to be built upon. I think it, I don't think it's the same critique, obviously, against Deleuze as it would be when they're talking about Descartes, but I th it has a similar tenor in my mind. Well, I wanted to frame it in a somewhat different way, which is that if you think back to the history of European philosophy, uh, and I prefer the term European philosophy to Western philosophy, which I think is a lot more problematic. But anyway, long story short, there's always been uh, a series of ironists who have appeared uh, that prick holes in any effort uh, for, to engage in philosophical or political systematicity. Uh, you can think of somebody like Socrates. You can think of somebody like Soren Kierkegaard, uh, who's responding to Hegel. Uh, and I think you could also include somebody like Jean Baudrillard, and for that matter, Jacques Derrida, in this list of a kind of minor literature of figures, right? Um, because again, what you really saw was somebody like Deleuze, uh, and for that matter, also with Foucault, is an attempt to engage in a kind of critical system building, even if it was opposed to previous systems uh, that had been existent. Uh, like you read Difference in Repetition, uh, there's still this very clear desire to go from ontological foundationalism of a certain kind, uh, the univocity of being, uh, to an argument for the need to respect difference in and of itself. Uh, and then to an argument, as Pills put it later on uh, in anti uh, that different kinds of beings should be able to liberate their desires in a certain way, to engage in schizoid lives of a certain sort. Uh, Foucault isn't quite as normative as Deleuze is, uh, but again, he still is has a very, very clear systematic or at least architectonic account of society. And near the end of his life, he was getting very close to starting to argue for a Nietzschean ethics of self-creation you know, with a little bit of Kant thrown in. Uh, and Baudrillard seems to me to be very much like somebody somebody like Socrates or Kierkegaard or Derrida, for that matter, who comes along and anytime someone tries to do this is just going to mock it relentlessly because the account of agency and liberation that's present with them uh, is much more anti-intellectualist in a certain sense. Because uh, what they're trying to say is that if you want to be free from the conceits of ideology, you also need to liberate yourself from the conceits of theory, which means to take an ironic distance towards everything, Right. Uh, and in a certain sense, that's what he's doing in this piece by insisting that we take an ironic distance from this kind of architectonic thinking that you, th that you see in Deleuze uh, and Foucault, which can very easily set themselves up 
as new kinds of totalizing ideologies, uh, but totalizing discourses, uh, even if they're critical discourses. So are you uh, saying Baudrillard is just a perpetual edgelord? Yeah, that's basically what I'm saying, right? Uh, and I mean, I he is offering some other ideas. He's not just saying no, no, no. He's no. also saying like this is a better way to do it. He he offers some like positive ideas. I mean, obviously, this whole article that we're reading here is framed as a critique, so you're going to get a lot of that. But he is he does suggest his own better quotes method. And do you guys remember what's the book that Foucault? Because Derrida makes a lot of the same charges in different language but a lot of the same charges against Foucault and Foucault wrote a book oh, about the Cogito back madness, to him right? was yeah. it Cogito and Madness uh I can't remember the name of the paper but yeah it was primarily about the interpretation of reason and the Cogito uh in that first book the history of madness and they had an exchange on the subject matter and... I mean I, if I remember correctly it wasn't an explicit response to Derrida but he tried to respond anyway but it's interesting that Deleuze and Derrida and Baudrillard have all the similar uh, vein of critique against Foucault, but uh, Baudrillard got the worst end of the stick on it, it seems like. Yeah. He did it too early. Yeah, I, want, I want to say that I agree with Eric, right, that I'm not saying that, you know, an ironist of this sort ever just sits there and says no, 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 or trashes everybody like an edge lord, you know, Ella Victor, right? I mean, if you think about somebody like Kierkegaard or Socrates or Derrida, right, uh, the act of deconstructing uh, or engaging in Socratic questioning uh, or revealing, you know, the instability of Hegel's system uh, does have a productive dimension to it because it allows you to take a kind of cognitive distance uh, between yourself and theories that are setting themselves up as alternatives of some way, in some way, shape, or form, right? And I think there are limitations to this kind of philosophical approach, uh, because I think some ways it can become a lot more nihilistic, even than something like Foucauldianism uh, for all its problems. Right. But it's also really refreshing sometimes to read somebody who is so completely iconoclastic, to use Pill's terms, and so irreverent uh, that he's not even going to truck any kind of systematic bullshit uh, from other critical philosophers. Anytime they try to set this stuff up, he's just going to be there to knock it down a couple pegs by saying, stop trying to retotalize power uh, as a substitute for classical political economy or sex or whatever it happens to be. Now, I'm just not going to let that happen. So as a side note, I would say that European philosophy is a much worse choice. You couldn't do worse than choosing to replace the idea of Western philosophy with European philosophy. Western <laughs> philosophy has has its downfall, but I mean, European philosophy, oh my God, we're, we're Plato and Socrates Europeans, I, that's that's debatable. And, and then that ignores the entire sphere of Eastern influence, not only that made its way into the Hellenic world, but also during the Islamic Middle Ages when they had their Renaissance and, you know, early modern philosophy got a massive kick in the ass from Eastern ideas and that sort. So it's very, very problematic. Oh, I completely suggest. agree with you. It's just that the reason I don't like Western philosophy is I think the whole concept of Western civilization is deeply offensive. Reason being, you know, having spent some time in Mexico, that despite speaking European languages, worshiping the same God, uh, and, you know, having the same form of government, for some odd reason, people in Latin America, and for that matter, elsewhere, uh, don't get to be part of the Western world for reasons I think that have more to do with their skin color than anything else. So I think what European philosophy is also hugely problematic. I just find it somehow less noxious in this notion that there's something like Western civilization. And I'll just I mean, it's Western funny when you, when you, when you, when you said that, when you said European philosophy, I actually always think about um, just like what, what a lot of people call continental philosophy, because I noticed yeah. that like in a lot, I notice on a lot of like PhD programs, a lot of departments like university departments, like they will sometimes say European philosophy as a euphemism for continental philosophy. Uh, they'll talk about like as yeah. opposed to yeah. Anglo, There's journals they, too, they, like the European Legacy yeah. and stuff, which is basically sure, just sure. continental philosophy journal. But, but I did I did want to pick up on something that that Eric said earlier to kind of bring it back to the way that Pill set this all up as in the context of '68, right? And like because because I mean I'm I'm interested in this claim that Baudrillard is making that supposedly you know the Foucauldian or Deleuzian views are somehow counter-revolutionary because they are mirroring, right? And, you know, I think, uh, but then Eric, you were talking about how a lot of Baudrillard's philosophy al also leads to, like, how do we get out of this kind of thing? And I do want to also, by the way, agree with you, um, you know, that, that I don't think the right way to approach these texts or continental European philosophy, whatever, 
is to be like, okay, how do we get out of this? Right. You have to take it up. You have to take the philosophy up. That's why I, I, I'm actually, you know, have no problem with descriptive philosophical accounts because they're incredibly valuable and you just want to take up the description and, and see where, see where it takes you. But, you know, it, it was interesting that you, you, you said Baudrillard kind of also leads to this conclusion that you might have from Foucault, that there's like no way to get out of these systems. But then like the way Pill set up this conversation was supposedly Baudrillard's critique of these guys is that they're counter-revolutionary because their systems are just mirroring uh, capitalism as this kind of system that you can't do anything about. So I don't know if there's, if there's a way to de- untangle those things or. Yeah. I mean, I think they're all looking at the 68 revolution quote, like quote unquote revolution. It was kind of a, a failed revolution. Right. And they're thinking about again, why has this revolution failed and what can we do differently? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. You, you can sort of parse it out a little further and say it's not, maybe it's not that they're they're counter revolutionary, but but that what they're describing, because it's become so clear and minutely describable that it is no longer a kind of revolution to even describe the workings of power and desire anymore by when did this come out 1976 or something like that so that's like it's like less than a little less than 10 years of reflection on on 68 which was one of those like 9-11 events for those guys back in that this time and they're thinking what like why what can we do differently now i guess it's to say i think people don't appreciate how huge an influence this has had on french philosophers if they're not kind of mired in that field uh, like Alain Bidjou, who I don't like very much, uh, released a very nice little book called, you know, The Pantheon, uh, which is just his account of the French philosophers. But one of the things that he opens with is that he's actually the last surviving member of the 68 generation. That's how he understands himself philosophically, right? Uh, there were all these guys, they wrote their books. He was a bit of a late bloomer, you know, kind of emerging in the 1980s. Uh, but he says, you know, I remember this happening. We were all kind of inspired by it, you know, uh, and then we all tried to look for the solutions for why it failed. Althusser had his account, Foucault had his account, you know, Deleuze and Guattari had their account. Uh, and so here's my kind of s- history uh, of these movements, right? I mean, it's in true to his form, Baudrillard has written a very quotable text here. And one of them, to this point, he says, in the end, the revolution signifies only this, that it has already taken place and that it had a meaning just before, one day before, but not anymore now. When it comes, it is to hide the fact that it is no longer meaningful. And so, again, with this, the, the idea of the, the reversal effect is that once you've sort of, relo- once you've like noticed that the revolution is here, that it's happening, that we can talk about it now, it's, it's, already, it's already lost its revolutionary potential. It's already, it's already gone. In a sense, and this this goes back to the idea of the simulacrum, I guess how it how it sort of redoubles things. Like you have you have on the on the one side you have uh, I mean I'm I'm just grasping now, but you know on the one side you have repression, and on the other side you have liberation of desire, and those he he says kind of you can't really talk about those apart, in in the sense that they both rely on one another to function in the world. You can't talk about oppression without oppressed you can't talk about these things separately because they function together as like almost as a single unit and i, I think he's charging foucault and and deleuze a little bit of doing this of, of separating the liberation of desire or sexual liberation from the repression of desire and repression of liberate of of uh, of sexuality right because foucault's ideas are about I mean, it's so complex because obviously we're we're already past all of these major thinkers who've gone into great detail about this stuff. But the idea of that sort of William Reich, this second generation Freudian, who had these ideas about sexuality and getting people to, you know, like gyrate and express themselves and ha- almost go into like catatonic states of self-expression where they lose all control and just scream and shout and yell. And, and all of this is somehow has a kind of revolutionary or not maybe liberatory kind of effect on society if everyone would just allow themselves to be more open about their sexuality and talk about it more. Foucault's already calling this 
the the remnants of a confessional kind of yeah. culture. And and so we've already got this amazing, like you read Foucault and you look at that, you're like, oh my God, okay, yeah, that's great. How can you get any further than that? And then you have Baudrillard coming along and saying, well, you've actually just separated liberation from repression and they're actually two sides of the same coin. And so how, okay, there, now there's a new statement in the philosophical field. How do we process Baudrillard's co contribution to this? Can I answer that? I do want to say that I think, Oh, sorry, I just want to say, I do think he misinterprets Foucault pretty badly here uh, in the history of sexuality in particular, right? Because while reading volume one, which I imagine, uh, I think had just been released or probably wasn't even out yet, um, you know, Foucault does sometimes write in terms of the repressive hypothesis and interrogating it. But certainly if you look at the whole oeuvre, he's very clear about the fact that this idea that there was a repressive time period that we're now liberating it, ourselves from, uh, is kind of a fantasy, uh, and he takes a much more productive. Well, yeah, no, I wasn't saying Baudrillard makes that mistake. Baudrillard oh, no, no, knows I'm, I'm what saying... Foucault's all about here, and he's trying to now like offer a new statement into that sort of setup, which already seemed to me almost complete. Saying, yeah, it's confessional. You know, asking people to express themselves is a kind of confessional gesture, and I thought, wow, it doesn't get any more like like deeply critical than that. And then you have here Baudrillard coming along, saying something new, finding room for critique of that. Okay. And it's very interesting. But to this me. is what I'm saying. I think that the two of them coincide in their views on this a lot more than this article would suggest. Right? No, I mean, no, they don't. They don't. Here's why. What's happening okay, here, right, Foucault's thesis of sexuality is supposed to be contrary and or contrary to the Freudian one, right? That Freud defines sexuality as repression, primarily, symptoms of repression. So for Foucault, it's not repression, but compelled expression, like you just said, Matt, but that when it appears, it's controlled in minute detail. So who who can you fuck? When can you fuck them? Is like a moral act. President Clinton, did you penetrate her face or Was her body? <laughs> what, like, what exactly did you do? Did you bust or did you not bust? I did not inhale. Are you, are you a homosexual? <laughs> are you a bisexual? And what percentage are you? Does your film have one breast in it? Or is there two? Because then you're going to get a higher rating. So it's that sexuality is micromanaged. This is Foucault's thesis, by the way. It's micromanaged in every, ex in every appearance, but it's also compelled to express or to be expressed. So you have to have like a sexual identity, you have to define yourself by that. Whereas in a repressive society, it wasn't like that. So that's the Foucault thesis. But Baudrillard well, here is suspicious about this thesis that says um, everything is micromanaged because he says, no, sexuality, and pornography proves it, sexuality is not being compelled, it's already disappeared. There is no reality to sexuality. This is just pure exchange at this point. And we still want to believe in it so we can talk about whether the repressive hypothesis is true or the, the expressive hypothesis is true. But the fact is the thing's already gone. And then to turn it into a theoretical object then, then you're, then you're like one further step removed, which is why he calls it a mirror. So at this point, when we're talking about sexuality in those terms, it's not just a mirror, but it's a mirror of a mirror which is, of course, the definition of hyperreality. So it's exchanged at this level where none of those questions even make a difference anymore. So he says something like, Foucault has a magisterial theory of sexuality. Too bad sexuality is already gone and doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I, I've, I'm finding these sort of newer ways of latching on to at least like Deleuze, but I, I don't think Baudrillard would be against this, is to, is to think about why do we always like what is this opposition between the molar and the molecular or the discursive and 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 sort of micro power micro fascism that sort of idea is because what we're on the one hand we're dealing with molar or discursive phenomena things you can see things you can interact with things that are on the plane of order things that are in the world of the visible right and then you have all these other ideas that work behind that the invisible molecular intensities, affects, power, those sorts of things that work behind the scenes in a sort of subversive way. And, you know, we, we all know that capitalism is in itself a subversive kind of thing, right? That's like one of Marx's basic statements about capitalism is like constant revolution. And so, you know, Deleuze and Guattari and Foucault's extremely 
brilliant insight was to let's sort of appropriate that revolutionary force and except they're going to talk about it in terms of the molecularization of desire and those sorts of ideas and and Baudrillard and what I'm seeing in these sorts of newer appropriations too is to actually give the molar some room get give the discursive or the realm of appearance or simulacra some room to be revolutionary in a sense because they like I said they are kind of two sides of the same coin you don't have the molar without the molecular and the other way around as well. And what I'm seeing here is a kind of willingness to not always associate, you know, discourse with kind of discourse with with these sorts of subversive levels of being power laden. Like let let it be what it is and then we can sort of look at it and and talk about what's invisible here. But first we have to go through the visible sort of thing. Okay, this is where I, I want to come in and just defend my argument that they're actually closer than Baudrillard is making it out to be. Uh, I think that certainly there are elements of Foucault's work that would make you think that he's centralizing an account of sexuality in this kind of magisterial fashion. And the fact that he wrote three, now four volumes on the subject you know, testifies to that. But I think if you look in his work, Foucault is very cognizant of the fact that this kind of hyperfixation on the importance of sexuality and sexual identity is extremely problematic and has been problematic from the very beginning. Uh, and in fact, one of the comments that he makes about his own sexual identity, or at least the one that he was tagged with uh, as a gay uh, in man, uh, is that he wants to resist being ascribed or interpolated in this fashion. Uh, and one of the things that he says about homosexuality that's quite interesting is that What's provocative about it isn't necessarily that it shows you uh, that we could we could have two men who enter into a sexual relation together, with either, but that it shows you that different kinds of social organization are possible than the ones that are conceived of in our current sexual regimes, right? And they don't necessarily have to be sexual relations. Uh, and he doesn't really develop this in great detail uh, because he died of AIDS, right? Uh, but it seems like he was moving in the direction that Baudrillard is arguing, not necessarily stuff about hyper-reality, uh, but being antagonistic to this magisterial uh, conception of sex like you're talking about. I mean, I don't know if he would carry, would have carried on this way had he lived, but that's just my take on it. Well, he says that, I mean, he's using uh, Foucault's understanding of sexuality as a metaphor for power, which is what Foucault does as well. Uh, power knowledge is a single concept. But Baudrillard's claim is that that thing needs you to believe that it exists, not that it exists. So believing that it exists and invest investing all this energy into it was for him the French left's fault because the political sphere had already been destroyed and then you're reinvesting all this meaning to it. And you could, I mean, I could, I don't want to jump into analogies to today, but you know what I'm thinking, right? He says, uh, here's quote, its strategy is, in fact, always creating a space of optical illusion, maintaining itself in total ambiguity, total duplicity, in order to throw others into this space. Yeah, I love that. Sure. <laughs> what I'm just trying to say is that Foucault is sometimes read uh, as agitating for a kind of micropolitics of identity. Uh, and I certainly think that you can see elements of that in his work and the kind of causes that he supported, right? Uh, and... So we have to be careful here. But I do think that if you read particularly his later work, again, stuff near the end of his life, he was becoming increasingly critical of this in a way that would be later echoed by gender theorists like Judith Butler, who was extremely critical of identity politics, ironically enough, when you think about the discourse around her. Because, you know, again, what Foucault says isn't that we should centralize the emancipation of sexual identities or refocus our attention on the construction of new sexual identities in a kind of rote way, uh, but see the interrogation of sex as an opportunity to think about how it is that human subjects are created and how it is that we can move past uh, these, kind, these kinds of political systems and power dynamics uh, in order to conceive new modes of existence that might not have anything to do with sexuality per se, uh, particularly given the way that sexuality has become so centralized and commodified in late capitalist society. Uh, and there's been some very interesting Foucauldian work done on this. You know, uh, a very good example is uh, how it is that um, Foucault talks about prostitution in 19th century uh, England and how even at this point, sex was becoming increasingly commodified during a time period where apparently the repressive hypothesis, uh, hypothesis or sorry, repressive uh, viewpoints were ubiquitous, right? Uh, it's where you see this extreme 
disconnect appearing uh, between the desire of capital to commodify sexuality, uh, and on the other hand, the Victorian ethos uh, and the power associated with that, still trying to impose this kind of moral view on society. So there's a lot of ways that you can kind of complicate this Foucauldian narrative. I mean, you're not wrong, but you're reading a lot into it. You're you're being yeah. you're being extra extra charitable. I am. I, I like yeah, Foucault's of course, work on this. Of right, course, so. we can we can come back and defend Foucault later, and no knocks on the guy, and not saying that he didn't like sort of modify his views. Even maybe he secretly read this article and really took it to heart and wrote his later books with it in mind. But I mean, I'm I'm just interested right now and sort of sussing out what Baudrillard is saying in this article rather than sort of leaping to the defense of, of each of those who he's wronged with his out-of-nowhere, unknown intellectual at the time attacking the bigwigs who need your defense. Sure, sure. They need us to jump to our, their defense. We could mount a robust defense on behalf of the people we like being being called out here, but the purpose of the episode is review someone else's challenge. Sure. And also, I you know, like I mean, essay, I mean, you know. Foucault and, and, and Deleuze really need our defense <laughs> in, compared to Baudrillard, right? Yeah, hey, it's, it's like good. nobody's reading them anymore. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. These dead guys, who, who's going to speak for them? Yeah. yeah. If not us. Baudrillard, though, is just a quotable factory, right? Yeah. Such good lines. Yeah, but you know, on the on the point of like the critique, I'm kind of curious. Pills, like, do, like, do you generally speaking, like, find that Baudrillard's critiques here are fair? Like, you don't have to go into detail, like, be, uh, like because as we said, we're not going to try to defend uh, Deleuze and, and and Foucault. But like, I'm just kind of curious on your take, like, generally speaking. Well, they're fair insofar as we've we've read this in a lot of graduate seminars, right? And I think people read Foucault rightly and they come away with the same feeling that it's like, oh, power is just everything. Okay, now what? So I think that part is correct. Um, not mm-hmm. not right now extending to biopolitics, which is a little mm-hmm. a little different from that. Um, but with respect to Deleuze and Guattari, they said that they were doing this. It's not like Baudrillard's pointing out something that they didn't know they were doing. Yeah. Like talking about deterritorializing flows, and they say capitalism is like the des- the productive desiring machine par excellence. Um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but it's from uh, Desert Islands, I think. So they said they were doing that, and then the question is, should philosophy be doing that or not? Should it be doing something else? And to that, I have absolutely no answer. I don't know what philosophy should be doing. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, I don't actually like the idea of somebody being like that. Sh- philosophy shouldn't be doing this. Like, you know, like I think my my kind of ad hoc reaction to that is just like, well, I don't think, uh, like, I don't, I just don't like the idea in principle of, of people being like, well, philosophy shouldn't be doing that. It should be doing this. It's like I don't know. That's it has to be much more free flowing than that. I, I think. And the answer to that might be that everyone that everyone is heralding this as like the most revolutionary philosophy. And it might be as simple as Baudrillard is pointing out, you know, that's not true. This is not the most revolutionary philosophy. It's Mm. just mirrored production. Um, And if that's the case, then, then fair enough. That's a fair critique. Yeah. But it depends. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to answer this for anybody, but what do you think theory should be doing? And I don't even, yeah, that's why I hesitate to answer. I stutter to answer that point, because I don't think that's for me to say. I'm a YouTuber. Yeah, agreed. Well, we know that mm-hmm. Victor is a Maoist, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. So <laughs> there's that answer settled there. No, but I, I think, I mean, I, I agree. I, I don't want to be this, the person to say, like, what's what it, what it should or shouldn't be philosophy or, or theory. Yeah. Yeah. I, at this point, I would have a hard time even drawing a line between philosophy and other disciplines. I mean... Foucault himself ran into this difficulty, and I would argue Baudrillard fits into it too. Is he a media theorist? Is he a cultural critic? Is he a philosopher? Is he kind of a weird Marxist? Who knows? Is Foucault a Nietzschean, a Kantian, a historian of ideas, a commentator of society? Who knows? Um, I, it's th- I think it's an interesting question, and if I thought about it a little bit more, I could come up with a better answer. I just think it's so hard to demarcate theory today from other disciplinary activities that we need to spend at least a little bit of time trying to come up with a kind of quasi essentialist answer about what we're talking about when we're engaging in theoretical activity. Perhaps a topic for another episode. Yeah. Well, that's what I wanted to say. Something exactly on those lines is Baudrillard was like ostracized for this and people read his later work and go, you know, what the fuck is this guy talking about? But this shows 
that he's got some theoretical chops. He's not afraid yep. to go after people. He was like, everyone basically took Foucault's side as far as I've read and can tell. And Baudrillard had a lot more difficult time getting jobs than Foucault did. And I'm not sure why Baudrillard went the way he went, which is far less argumentative. But I think he tried to bring what he's saying here into the style where you can't say, you just can't replace right. my words with someone else's words because my words are like, oh, now I'm writing in aphorisms. So he did, mm. he he made his form the content of the argument that he's sort of making here. He can't be replaced. There is only like one Baudrillard. Mm. Yeah, I mean, just to give a testament to how, to speak to your point, Pills, and how famous Foucault was, um, I can't remember what institution it is. It was the University of Paris whatever number it is, eight or nine or 25. Uh, but they actually created a special chair just for him because he didn't like being called a philosopher, kind of back to the point. He wanted to be the historian, a historian of ideas, right? And he was so famous at this point that the university was like, if you fucking want to do that, call yourself it. We don't give a shit, you know? But it yeah. speaks to his power that Deleuze <laughs> got, I mean, not Deleuze, that Baudrillard got, uh, he had to go to Disneyland by himself. <laughs> After he was all he's there. riding the, the teacup ride all, all alone with a cigarette hanging out with cinderella yeah yeah just little mm -hmm. kids coming up to him they're like what do you think about this he's like well enjoy this soon this will be all your reality and then mm -hmm. there'll be nothing that was only a dear piece staring back at you yeah. <laughs> i mean the, the weird thing about it too though is again he did eventually become a celebrity i mean this is going to sound really really cheesy but my first exposure to his work was in The Matrix, you know, when Neo picks up the book and it's simulacrum and simulacrum and he opens it up and there's a little fucking thing in it. Simulation. Simulacrum. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Excuse me. And, um, you know, I I read that about the guy later on and I picked it up and I read it and stuff. But you know, people commented on how weird it is that Baudrillard himself became kind of a celebrity appearing in Hollywood blockbuster films and having people argue about his work in them and stuff. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say he's a fascinating, he's it's, got a fascinating and, and sort of offbeat perspective compared to all of these other ph philosophers, theorists, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but mm -hmm. he, but he's also like, I don't get the sense he's doing anything radically different, but he does have interesting ideas that feel like they're new, you yeah. know, just these quotable little quips, like instead of Foucault's functional vision of power. We need to say power is something that is exchanged. Power seduces. Mm. And he brings all these different words in like simulation and simulacrum later on in a book he publishes a couple years after this article we're reading. And so he's got a very interesting and lately I'm, I'm having looked into Marshall McLuhan a little bit more. You know, there's a lot of echoes of McLuhan in Baudrillard as well which I find very interesting because I, I find a lot of thinkers tend not to address media and technology or anything in, in depth anyway, in a, in a way that people can find, you know, like relatable. Whereas Baudrillard is giving us that. He's giving us this sort of high philosophy, but you can also think about like our, our surrounding world in it that's very, very mediated by technology and media and and images and messages. And I, I think that's part of what makes Baudrillard extremely appealing, despite this sort of early uh, kerfuffling he had with uh, with the French intellectual community. Yeah, and, and I agree with Pels completely that Baudrillard, I agree this piece is more dense than some of his later work, but was just fantastic at spinning off remarkable ideas, some of which are a little underdeveloped, but they're extremely provocative. Uh, I mean, in Simulacra and Simulacrum, uh, he has that famous statement uh, about how he says, we shouldn't even be talking about the real anymore because we've now entered into the desert of the real, which is later on the title of his Zizek book and also appears in The Matrix, right? I mean, that's extraordinarily provocative, right? Talking about Borges stories and then discussing the desert of the real. Or to title a book, you know, The Gulf War Never Happened. I mean, before you even read the book, you're going to have a fucking opinion on it, right? Like something in this visceral is going to be there inside of yourself, uh, wanting to respond to it. Or this whole notion of hyper-reality and stuff. So just to our listeners who think that I'm shitting on him for, you know, defending Foucault and stuff, I think the guy is fascinating, right? He's There's few thinkers uh, on the French left that I can conceive of who are more enigmatic and interesting than he is. 
I just also find him frustrating sometimes. And just a quick uh, like correction, I think, before. So the, the title of the book definitively is Simula- Simulacra and Simulation, just to be clear. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. There we go. I actually fuck that up all the time. Always put simulation know, first. Yeah. yeah, just say any any yeah. declension. It's like bodies without words, organs and organs without bodies. I fuck it up all Okay, so as this is fight night, I don't think it was a knockout. But we're gonna we're gonna have to give it to the judges. See the scorecards to see whose hand gets raised at the end of this. Uh, we are not the judges. We'll leave it to you. Yeah, hopefully we presented mm-hmm. it well. And can I just a quick little aside about the text? And I should mention too for the listeners that this text is very short. Like I think the actual the actual yeah. text of the forget uh, Foucault is only what like forty pages or something. Yeah. So stay tuned for our next fight nights. We have a lot to choose from. Thankfully. Um, maybe give a recommendation if you have one for us. Yeah, that's a good but, idea. But, uh, we're going to do a few of these because they inspire debates on both sides and, uh, interesting, mm-hmm. interesting content. So, uh, thank you guys. We'll see you Peace. later.